Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Rob Latham. I've been uh, working on parallel I.O. and storage systems for a while, and uh, I'm presenting some work that I've done with my colleagues at Argon, uh, and also uh, Phil, uh, Kevin Harms is, is here to give me some uh, internet support on uh, the Slack channel. Uh, he'll also help us with material as well. All right. So we only have, you know, 90 minutes. I really can't condense a lifetime of experience in just 90 minutes, but I can give a few pointers on where to get started when you have a, an I.O. problem in your application. And so I like to tell people, even if you don't think you do, uh, you, you do have an I.O. problem. Uh, it may just be a matter of time before it rears its head. So uh, let's start off with a sort of big picture, right? In computational science, we, we can't do, we can't, we have to sometimes use computers to model the world around us. We can't detonate supernovas in our labs, so we have to use numerical methods to simulate what goes on there. Uh, the problems are getting more and more sophisticated, more and more faithful, and as a result, we need larger and larger computers and more computing devices to help run those experiments. Now, with that comes a larger and larger data problem and a larger and larger number of storage devices. So uh, finding the right way to tune these large storage systems for applications is my whole job here at Argon. Right, applications don't think about storage in terms of a, a file on a disk or an offset into a, into a file. They're thinking about uh, structures of a nuclear reactor or a fuel assembly or a, a patch of atmosphere. Right? The, the, the abstractions that scientists are thinking about are higher level than the low level storage stuff. And so uh, the abstractions and models that are used for applications have their own uh, rules and structures, and it would be great to be able to map that in a straightforward way to the storage system. Right? And so uh, the, the libraries that I work on at Argon are, are part of that mapping process. Right, so computational science is already hard enough. Uh, the, the IO challenges added on top of that make the job uh, all the harder. Right? Uh, you've got very large uh, machines with very high bandwidth networks, but to get the most bandwidth out of these networks, both communication and storage, we need a large amount of links working together. But if you were to just arbitrarily and, and capriciously light up all these links, you would probably flatten the storage system and, and or exhaust other resources. So we need some sort of management there. Furthermore, uh, the data management isn't just about pushing data out to storage, but it's about what you're going to do with that data later. Uh, collaborators or, or even your own groups will look at this data and try to uh, render movies out of it or analyze it for statistical things of interest. And so if the file format is in some kind of conventional, easy to understand, easy to work with format, that will make everyone's job a lot easier. And we have uh, tools and libraries that can help make all this a lot easier to do. So you don't have to invent this all on your own. So when we talk about the I.O. on these systems, we often use a abstraction, a layers of abstractions, just like anywhere else in computer science. At the very foundation of the level is, is the, uh, are the storage devices, the hard drives that are spinning on these machine, uh, machine room floors. <laughs> the storage devices are aggregated with something with typically a parallel file system. And this parallel file system will uh, provide a logical namespace, some kind of collection of all these devices, and, and expose that collection to all of these processes. But uh, it may not have a lot of uh, sophisticated APIs, it's just uh, like a namespace. On some systems, you might have an I.O. forwarding layer, which will help manage the scalability. We won't talk about it too much in this talk, but it's, it could be a piece of the software puzzle on your system. And then, uh, working our way up, there's a, typically an I.O. middleware layer. This middleware layer is it's usually the MPIO library, or Romeo, but it's the, it's the library that is dealing with uh, the notions of many processes working together. So for many, for many people, that's going to be an MPI kind of programming model, and you'll we'll use MPIO to think about and, and describe the I.O. But uh, while that middleware layer is pretty good at introducing concepts of, of 
people of processes working together, it could be a little bit of a rough interface with regards to how applications want to think about their data. So on top of that, a high-level I.O. library, something like HDF5 or Parallel Net CDF, uh, wraps up the middleware layer and provides an abstraction that makes sense for the application. So typically that's multidimensional array to type data. So in this talk, in the hour and a half we've got, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on at the middleware layer, and I'll talk some more about some examples. I'll, give a, I'll spend a bit of time on the parallel NetCDF high-level I.O. library. But uh, I want you to remember the bigger picture, too, that there are multiple high-level I.O. libraries, and so uh, you should go find one that makes sense for your domain. Before we get too much further into these different software libraries, I wanted to take a slight detour and talk about a tool that we use to help understand what's going on on these systems. And part of the examples that I've got uh, in this talk, we'll, we'll use this tool called Darshan to help uh, try to demonstrate and show off the differences between these different approaches. So there's an important word in this next slide, characterizing the application I.O. Uh, lots of tools exist to trace or, or um, otherwise uh, uh, capture what's happening at the application level to do these I.O. patterns. But what would be great is if we could do a couple of things. We would like to not get in the way of the application very much. And we'd like to be able to an uh, have these, have, yeah, answer these questions all the time without having to do a second experiment to figure out what's going on. So in order to do that, in order to meet those goals, oh, we have a couple of different uh, approaches here. We're not capturing every I.O. activity here and recording it for posterity, but we are uh, sampling the I.O. in a certain way. I shouldn't say sampling. We are um, well, characterizing. We're, we're, we're keeping track of counters. We're keeping track of timers and other uh, sort of uh, data structures that are, that are founded in memory and overhead. So as the application runs, we may update a counter, and then the application exits, we'll exit it out. And then we can use these characterizations to answer questions. How much time was spent in I.O.? Let's use the first question, right? If, if we're spending 90% of our time computing, then maybe the, the I.O. optimizations aren't going to get us a whole lot of benefits. But if the ratio is reversed, if we're spending 90% of our time in I.O., then, then any gain of I.O. time will have a direct result, a direct impact on that scientific application. And then Right, because computational scientists are not I.O. experts, it's quite likely we'll find access patterns or uh, styles of access that don't make sense for the systems that are deployed, and we can, we can work with application people and make that go faster. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Darshan. Uh, I think it's available on all the machines that you have access to. Uh, we've worked pretty hard to make sure that our, uh, our site facilities uh, don't have any objections to keeping it on and available, but uh, you know, if we look at your documentation to see if it was the story there, it is for each of the different sites. Uh, but the goal of Darshan is that we can deploy it and it'll capture uh, behavior of applications without imposing a whole bunch of overhead. In fact, uh, we try to keep it to almost no overhead. Uh, we do this a couple different ways, right? We're, we're logging to memory, or not logging, we're, we're capturing the specific memory. So as an application is doing reads and writes, the amount of uh, disturbance that Darshan is going to introduce to that access pattern is negligible. And then that memory footprint is already fixed. It's a, it's a few hundred bytes in the, in the common case, and if you do one file per process, it could be a few kilobytes. But all that data is then Say at the end of the, of the file, of end of the program, and when you get MPI finalized, you write it out, and, and so uh, nobody's really, you know, complaining if MPI finalized takes an extra second or two. Uh, but we again, we're trying to do things uh, nice and that. And that really, you know, the, the log files been compressed, we're running out a small amount of data. We do it all at the end. Yeah. And then the summary will help tell us what's going on. So what does this look like? Oh, sorry, it's a little more of the design. Uh, the design of Darshan is to capture the routines at link time, right? This way, we don't require applications to do any manual instrumentation of their own. Uh, so anytime you directly or indirectly call a POSIX read call or write call, that'll be a Darshan counter implemented. You call an MPI file write call, that'll turn into an MPI counter implemented, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, yeah. So the great thing about Darshan and why it's been so useful for us over the years is it's not only helpful for just the users who get a handy summary of what the application was doing, but because we can keep it on for all applications and all the time, at all times, we get an overall view of what's going on on these systems. So thousands of jobs run on, on NERSC, and, and NERSC logs these to a database, and the users can, the operators can periodically mine this database and say, hey, look, is anybody doing something very bad in this file system? And they can find that person before the user is even aware of what they might be doing. And you out and teach them. Okay. So if you look at the documentation at your site, uh, you'll see something about where the Darshan logs are kept. You can then apply this uh, Perl script to turn a, a binary log file into something a little more human readable. And this log file will tell you the, the big questions you have about, yeah, help you answer the big questions about your application. In the upper left corner, we've got a, a rough bar graph saying how much, so the, we know how long the application ran. We, we started the timers at the beginning and the end. And we know how much time was spent in I.O. So we can talk about how much time was spent as a percentage of runtime. And we're counting up operations. How many times did you open the file and close the file and seek in the file and things that, you know, maybe one or two opens isn't very expensive, but if you're making 10,000 open calls or a million open calls, you know, maybe we need to rethink about how we're managing our files a little bit. For me, the, uh, the middle, this middle left histogram is, is one of the more useful ones. Uh, the, the histogram is maybe hard to read at the scale, but it's binning the operation in you know, 100, 100 bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, and so on. And so if you see a bunch of tiny little reads and writes, the, the leftmost histogram bin, that's a sign that we need to do something, we need to rethink what's going on at the application. If you see most of the operations happening on the, the right-hand side, then you're being pretty friendly to the file system, and, and we can stop that avenue of optimization and look at something else. The rest of this is our, our things like common access sizes and a little bit about which files are being used and where. So, you know, if you are, uh, for example, a common problem would be to do your heavy I.O. to a shared uh, home file system. That's typically not tuned for this sort of workload. Instead, you'd want to see uh, the, the, the files being hosted on a parallel file system. All right, so uh, we, we can and do find users making mistakes, or not mistakes, but ways they can do things better. Right? So uh, in this example, we have an application that's working on 120, some 120 bucks. Yet, uh, when we, we see that they've, uh, they've done uh, 512 operations on these files, so clearly something somewhere is, is reading this file over and over again. And so we're seeing four times more I.O. than expected. Now, there wasn't a huge uh, cost here, but here's an example where the user is, is dead said that, yes, I am doing I.O. this way, but the Darshan log says, no, it turns out you've made a mistake and uh, you're actually doing something a little bit different. And then we can work with that. Uh, there's many times where, where the Darshan log has helped short circuit one of these conversations and put us on the right path for getting things up. So here again, another example. Uh, in this case, there's like three billion bytes of one byte to a file. Uh, so, um, even though storage systems are changing over time and we have flash and uh, non volatile though RAM, uh, I would still say that for the, for the foreseeable future, one byte reads and writes are going to be very bad for your file system. So if there's any way to change that around, you can get from, you know, one megabyte a second to the multiple gigabytes a second that these systems are capable of, just by making a few adjustments on And maybe we can cache something better or change the access sizes a little bit. Uh, so here again, uh, not just about applications, but not about individual applications, but we can also look at uh, the overall view of what's going on in these systems. Here's a case where we can get a report about the users and what file systems they're using and, and how much data they're reading and making sure that everything's behaving as we expect. Uh, so if you have Darshan on your site, it will come packed up, packaged up with a bunch of other things you can look at. Uh, you can create the summary file we talked about. You can 
you can get a raw text output of, of all the statistics if that's something you're very interested in. I'm actually that's what I use the most, but uh, that's because I've been looking at this for a while. It's probably not your first go-to piece here, but there. And then we have a, a user community that has contributed a bunch of other uh, things like like Ruby bindings, Darshan, and uh, what's been really exciting for our, our friends at, at NERSC is this. Uh, Idea of the Tokyo project. They're using Darshan along with other logging systems, logging yeah, other uh, information about the storage systems, and creating dashboards to show you an overall view of what's going on here. With the, with the. Uh, so I did a little bit of legwork here, trying to figure out on your systems where the Darshan data is. Your ALCS, NERSC, NCSA. We can find you can find web pages talking about. Uh, how to use Darshan, where the log files are. You know. So when you run your your, uh, your application, maybe you're already getting Darshan logs, and you might find a few uh, sitting there for you. So the nice thing about Darshan, you know, maybe it's not the, maybe there's other tools out there that you want to consider if you are going to either look for a tool to replace Darshan or do something like what Darshan is doing. Uh, I would uh, suggest, especially at these large petascale and scale systems, uh, the, the approach of a generation of just logging all the data, creating log, large traces, while that is very useful at times, uh, the, the number of elements that are involved, the, the size of the logs and the number of clients, makes that in, intractable in many cases. And certainly you couldn't leave it on all the time without severely degrading storage. So uh, you know, look for tools that are looking, that have a a life, a life footprint, are capturing a subset of information or characterizing information, and are uh, you know staying out of the way of the application as much as possible. So with that preliminary out of the way, I'm going to spend a little time talking about the MPIO libraries. I have a few examples to walk through here. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail uh, because I want to contrast sort of the the hard way with MPIO and the uh, the more e easier way with these application oriented libraries. Uh, oh, but before I get in, is anybody talking about things anywhere? Any questions? No, question. nah, everyone's great. Okay. Everybody went to get some lunch when we had the AV trouble, but that's okay. Great. MPIO. So if you have, you know, Open up a terminal. You start writing some some code. You don't, you're not using MPI, but you're just using the old serial interfaces, a POSIX interface. You're going to have some problems trying to describe uh, large parallel access. Well, what are the problems here? Well, you know, open, write, seek, read, close. These are the basic building blocks of 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 uh, I/O on these on these systems. Uh, it's been around for since 1970s, and, and in the 70s, right, we didn't have this idea of, of Thousands of nodes of uh, working on a file system. We just had a single time-shared system, and so uh, it was not a big deal to have a very new primitive interface. But this interface uh, can't do much, right? There's no way to describe when you open a file that not only am I opening this file, but many processes are opening the file. When you write the data, there's no way to describe what kind of data you're writing. You just simply can say, you know, linear stream of bytes. I want to write the next x bytes of data. And there's no idea of structure in the file. There's no idea of how to describe that structure, and and so uh, so that's the so the interfaces are very straightforward, yeah, very simple in that regard. Uh, I'm not a big Fortran programmer, but I know there's a little I know a little bit about Fortran just enough to know that it's even the story there is even a little more complicated because you know, record-based I/O is going to be padding some of the fields, and and so different compilers may or may not have padding or may have different amounts of padding, so. Portability is going to be tougher with the Fortran interface, uh, and in neither one of these cases is there a, is there a notion of uh, machine portability, you know, and, you know, architecture independence. If you just get uh, binary is basically the same format that it is in memory, and then that's how it, how it is. So if you're taking that from one machine to another, you may have to worry about different portability concerns. Right. So I know earlier, if, 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 you, if some of you, if you've been here for the whole four days of, of Petascale Institute. Uh, there was a couple days of MPI programming um, earlier this week. Uh, so when you think about MPI I.O. inside an MPI context, it's 
a little weird, right? MPI is a message passing interface, but a lot of the concepts that made MPI a strong and, and useful tool for parallel programming also make it useful for parallel I.O. In MPI, you have the notion of data types that describe the structure of memory, and we can pass those data types, we can use those data types to exchange data with other processes. Well, when you're writing to a file, that's kind of like sending data to a process, and you're reading from a file, that's kind of like receiving them from a process. And it's for the same reasons that you might want to describe your data in an MPI send with a data type, you would have the same sort of structure of the file on disk. Similarly, right, collectives in MPI have been very useful for getting uh, efficient communication and, and, high, and high bandwidth. Well, collective I.O. has the same story. When you, have, when you can tell the library, hey, all these 10,000 processes are hitting an I.O. port support point, I.O. point now, and they're all going to work together, why don't we uh, see what we can do to make that go faster? So before I get into the name of the source code, I want to talk a bit about the collective I.O. What does that, does that mean? And there, there are definitely cases in scientific computing where all the processes are, are hitting some point where they're all going to do I.O. at the same time. You now, the, the counterpart, the counterpart, counterpoint to collective I.O. would be independent I.O. Independent I.O. is unorganized and, and it doesn't provide any context to the libraries. Uh, but if you have uh, collective I.O., you're able to uh, do a few things, right? Um, you can do things like transform the many small requests that might be natural to a scientific application. You can, the library can transform them into something that makes a little more sense for the file system. And you know, being a little bit vague there, because different file systems behave differently, we can, we, can, we can hide that detail from the user and do all those changes in the library itself. And you know, now the, the library knows how many processes are working, and so we can pick you know, uh, a subset of processes to the I.O. delegates. We can, we can transform I.O. requests. Now, the counterpart, the, the, the drawback to collective I.O. is that, yes, it, it assumes that processes have all marched in, in, in a straight line and it hit a point together. So reading a check, reading a initial condition data set, that might be a natural place to do collective I.O. Or writing a checkpoint after doing a simulation for a few iterations. But if you have a more uh, amorphous structure and, and different processes are doing different amounts of work and they're hitting their I.O. periods uh, at different times, collective I.O. may not be the best fit. And certainly, as we get larger and larger scale, you just consider uh, what, are the, what are the synchronization costs or pseudo-synchronization costs if one process is, a, is slow to enter a collective while everybody else is waiting for that process. And, and that becomes more and more a factor when you have tens and hundreds of thousands of clients. All right. So source code. All right. To look at, so, let's consider two processes, purple and orange, that are going to write to uh, different regions of a file. And in a real application, this might be uh, cubes of a, of a volume rendering or uh, slices of, of space as we're trying to do some molecular dynamics code. But in this simple example, the purple process and the orange process can each describe what they're going to do and then execute it. So first we open the file with, with MPI file open. That's a collective call, as, as you can tell from the communicator parameter. And now the library knows all these processes are going to be involved in the operation. There, is, there are two steps involved in doing I.O. First, we set a file view. This is describing which areas of the file the process is interested in, that, that file view is a setting up file view is a collective all, but it is a, <laughs> each process that's what it is interested in. So in this case, the purple process says, well, give me every uh, fifth block starting at the zeroth block. And the orange process is the same thing, but instead of starting from the zeroth block, it's starting from the third block. Or I'm not sure exactly if that's right or not, but you, know, you can structure, you describe the data with an MPI data type, and that's your file type. Now, MPI file write all with the underscore all uh, suffix, that's uh, how we indicate it in the collective. Then we can describe with the, with the memory data type, in this case the data type parameter, uh, how our data is structured in memory. So uh, that could be entirely different from how it's structured on disk. Uh, there could be a natural way to operate on data as you're doing your simulation, but there's maybe a more uh, collaborator-friendly format on disk. 
no reason, there's no need to just do a direct map, memory map to disk. We can do all kinds of reorganization of data if that's what's needed. Um, I think uh, I think I talked about most of this already, but I do want to point out that a common question for beginners is, what do you do if uh, in a collective MPIO call if some processes have lots of data and some processes have no data? And that's perfectly fine to have everybody call that collective. Uh, even if you have no, no data to contribute, the process that has no data may actually turn out to be the one that has to do the most uh, I.O. to the file system. It may be well connected to the, it may be topologically speaking, best connected to the storage system. So uh, have, you know, have, all, have all the processes participate, and uh, whether you have uh, zero bytes or a thousand bytes or a million bytes, it should be fine. All right. So uh, I have a, a URL up here for a, uh, a repository of a few examples you can check. You can check out. Uh, I'll give you a go ahead and, and check that out uh, and see if you can. Uh, I'll walk through it a little bit. But in this in this directory, there's an array directory. In this, in this repository, there's an array directory. That array directory contains a few example skeleton codes. And uh, the thought is, you can stub out. You know, you can take these stubs and, and fill them out and make them do. Um, what the exercise would like. Uh, if you get stuck, there's a solutions directory. You can peek in there and, and see and, uh, where the ISX things. But of course, there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, I will warn you everything to see here because that's what I write in all the time. Uh, so uh, if you have questions about how to do things in Python or Fortran, I might be able to help a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I'll be able to have more questions. All right. So, Let's talk about the problem I want you to think about here. Again, these are toy problems because you know, we have so much time to talk about this material. But multidimensional arrays show up in all kinds of scientific applications. And you know, just because this is a simple 2D array, uh, the same uh, concept should apply to uh, multidimensional arrays. All right, so in this case, we have a 2D array. And we're going to have every MPI process write a um, write a row to this array. We're also going to have a small header on this data that describes the, the, the science that we're doing. Right? There's a, we've done some iteration. We want, to, we want to tell the users, look, this blob of data on this disk, <coughs> it's actually you know, uh, 16 rows by 45 comps. So, you know, whatever the answer is. <coughs> so what natural way to do that would be to put a small header on the file. But of course, we don't need every process to write that header. Uh, if everybody knows the size of the data and what iteration we're on, ring zero could do that with an independent call. Then we talk about file views a little bit. Here's a case where uh, we will set a, uh, a fairly simple file view here. The, these are just rows of, of integers. So we don't need to create complicated MPI data types. We can use the MPI int type. As I mentioned, we're trying to put a small header here. So file set view does allow you to say, look, ignore the first few bytes here. Uh, do all this math relative to this starting offset. And that'll simplify your computations later on. Then if you have every process right, you know, MPA file write at all is a, a collective call. But you have to figure out that at call, right? So we look at uh, you know, where we're going to be when we can compute that algorithmically. Um, you know, range should be your MPI rank, and then if everybody's writing uh, X by Y amount of data, we can just start at that point in the file. And uh, the MPI idiom, idiom is often a buffer count data type tuple. So in this case, you have a, an array of values, uh, size of that array, and then what kind of type it is. Right, so Kind of like a cooking show, right? You, you turn over here to the oven, we can pull out some solutions and talk about how you might do some of this stuff with some real source code. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, one thing I would like to point out I, I always wrap my MPI file uh, and process calls with an error checking macros because, as uh, you know, see, right, you don't get, um, get to do your own error handling. And if you don't do your error handling, you'll often find cases, no matter how experienced you are, 
where uh, the file open that you were guaranteed, you were sure you would never fail, uh, failed, and then you try to write some garbage file handle, and you try to figure out what's going on here, and really the problem was three or four lines above. So uh, you can see in the skeleton code, the way I do that sort of macro, uh, you can do it however you like, but I would encourage you to always check the error codes. And file write, uh, right, rank zero, only need, only need to do the header to the file. Then we can do a collective I/O for everybody with MPI file right at right at all. Uh, let's see, point out here, right? Rank times xdim times ydim gives us a, a number of integers into the file. Again, because the file view is working on byte on integers, uh, MPI ints, right? So we can we don't have to worry about how big is an int on this system. We can just count in the file. And, uh, again, if you had a more sophisticated uh, data type, you, you might just write one of those out instead of doing this math here. So let's say some time has passed. You have an example. You want to see what did it do. Right? Well, of course, you, you're creating a small, small file on some parallel file system somewhere. But uh, if you had your Darshan log, uh, you know, I would encourage you to go go find your site documentation, uh, find out where the Darshan log is, and then before you generate the report or, or look at the, the raw data, think about what do you expect to see from a code that's going to do uh, an MPI file write followed by an MPI file write at all? Now, um, a couple things to think about, right? Uh, we, we did make two MPI calls here, uh, one independent, one collective. The data we passed through the collective call was fairly simple, a contiguous chunk of data, so your MPI implementation might uh, just see that and say, hey, you know what, this is simple enough, we're going to go right to the independent case and, and not do any optimization. Uh, on some systems, the doesn't matter how simple or complicated the type is, it, it will always do some kind of collective optimization. So kind of you, know, you can learn something about your implementation from even a simple uh, example. But again, uh, I can't really speak to the, to the four different platforms. I have the most experience with uh, Argon's the LCS machines, uh, but I've um, I've also found Darshan log files on Cori's machines, and, uh, the Darshan machines, Cori, and, uh, and other sites too. And if you, if you really don't have Darshan available on your machine, you can also just build it and run it on your laptop or run it on your home directory directly. It's, uh, not, I'd say it's not too hard to build. And other than, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so of course, you, there's a lot more going on in MPIO than just writing out columns of arrays. So uh, there's, a, there's lots of machinery that can be happening in here. And again, uh, I introduced this work, this, this, these concepts, not because I need you to be experts in it, but because I want to give you a little bit of an appreciation of what's happening at these higher level libraries. You know, it's easy to get removed from with the section layers and, and, and different uh, libraries that are between the application and the file system, it can be easy to forget uh, what's going on. Um, you don't need to be experts at this. You don't need to know all this stuff to, to, be, to have good I/O performance. But uh, if someone says, hey, you're, oh, you, you got bad performance because you're hitting lots of lock contention, well, then you can maybe understand a little bit if I take a few minutes to talk about that. So on just about every file system, yeah, I think that's a pretty fair statement to make. All the file systems you're going to have access to have a file system that's, that's split up into some kind of unit. It's going to be a page or a block, or those will have something that's going to be between four kilobytes and eight megabytes in, in size. And the file system will manage those blocks and, and allocate those files and, and update them. And that's a perfectly fine model when there's one process doing that, you know, this is the same thing as using hard drive storage systems all the way up. But when you have multiple processes and multiple nodes and multiple applications you know, that are reading or, or, or specifically writing to the same block or same region of the file, then we have a coordination problem. There's a, there's a notion of, of locking, and, and it's kind of an overloaded term, right? You can 
explicitly lock a file as a user, an application you can you can write a, a coordination uh, routine that this is locking the file and taking exclusive access on this. But the locks I'm talking about here are lower level locks or system level locks, and so there's a, they're in a sense uh, hidden from what you can see as a user, and so uh, it can be a little tough to figure out what's going on here. So, all right, both processes they're writing into a boundary, and so what's the process going to do? It's simply going to serialize access there. One of those processes will win, update the block, and then go back to work, and then the, the next process that came in will then update the block and, and proceed. And that serialization, right, is exactly what we don't want in a parallel file system. And there's different ways that this can happen. Um, maybe we have a, a, a so maybe we've taken a very simple scientific uh, scientific array structure because scientists you know, I'm going to be smart my file system. I'm going to be, I'm going to write uh, big 4K chunks out of the file system or 4 megabyte chunks. And so I'm going to use uh, I'll make my, my arrays be four megabyte rows, and I'll just have lots of rows. And then we'll do row-based row I/O, and it'll be great. Uh, okay, that might be fine, right? The green process, the purple process, and the orange process all get their own separate regions of the, of the file. The file system will will do its best to deliver I/O to those processes in a parallel fashion, and you get high performance. But you know, time passes, and we realize, hey, you know, instead of just having these, these big chunks of data, I want to put a little header on here to figure out. Now what's going on to help document my, document, document my data. And now everything's been shifted just enough that these processes are all sharing lock boundaries. And this, this one little unaligned access, especially, especially if you're working on something like TPFS, can totally tank your performance. And then, of course, if the distribution is not row-oriented but some kind of cyclic distribution, then there's, there's, there's processes scrambled all over the file, like in this case the green process and the purple process and the orange process, all one data that's all over the file. And that's going to be uh, a little challenging to, to do unless you, you have some of the optimizations that are happening inside the MPI IO library. So transformations. We speak broadly about transformations because there is a, in a sense, a platonic ideal of what this file system would see. Everybody's going to write to one large block of I/O or uh, some natural region, but there's a, a difference. You know, the applications think differently. So in this case, <coughs> this cartoon here on the slide, you know, process zero, one, and two have their own data that they've worked on, and they've uh, there's going to be a write. At, they're going to write out to the storage in some way that is, is good for collaborators, and so. Uh, there's a little bit of interleaving here going on, right? Well, uh, there's a transformation we can do that would help turn that into a more friendly uh, access pattern. Again, you don't have to worry about this as a as writer, as a, uh, as a, a computational scientist, but it's helpful to know what's going on inside the library. Uh, another optimization that, that sometimes happens in, in MPIO, and an optimization that happens in, in RAID devices or Really, all of all of the places in computer science is this idea of uh, reducing operations through a read, modify, write. We might call it data saving in, the, in Romeo, but what's happening here is you have a application that wants to make several small updates or many small updates into a region of the file. Now, the application could do that with with multiple individual calls, and that would be a way to do things. Uh, but typically on these file systems, right, we have very large compute systems that are that are networked to a storage system, and that networking to the storage system part means that we have high bandwidth but also high latency. So things you can do that reduce the number of operations will improve your throughput and improve your performance, even if you're moving more data than you might want. So step one in this data saving example, we read in the data into a temporary buffer. Make all the updates in step two, and in step three, write it out in a single call. So now instead of making n small operations, we've done two big operations. And maybe we've moved a lot of data, but those two operations are going to be high bandwidth operations, and only two operations, only paying only two, uh, paying the latency cost twice, that should give us pretty good performance. Another way we can avoid block contention, another way we can transform data is this, it's called two phase. I/O two-phase collective buffering. 
this is the case where uh, step one is, is all the processes look at the data they have and they do an exchange. So we have all these, we have this high speed network on these machines that use that, and so all the processes can can shuffle data around and put it in in the right place, and then some subset of other processes possibly could then do the I/O in an efficient manner. And this is this optimization helps a lot, uh, especially on uh, so it's helped a lot in blue gene, and it helps a lot with Luster because it's a very particular way that you need to transform your data to take the performance on Luster file systems, and we can encapsulate all that inside the MPI IO library. This is the uh, don't do it yourself approach. Uh, the, the lesson on this slide is don't do it yourself. There's a lot going on, uh, and if you try to do it yourself, you'll probably get it wrong. Uh, in again, in this case, we have the linear stream of bytes because that's the model that these file systems offer the IO library, and so we might have a subset of processes called aggregators. The IO aggregators could then maybe divide up the access from the first offset to the last offset, divide by the n aggregators you have, and see what happens there. Well, that might work in, in some cases, but you're likely to have that lock contention we talked about, where the aggregators are going to be uh, overlapping on a lock boundary. So we can do a small adjustment and make sure maybe one process has a little bit bigger uh, file domain and one has a little smaller file domain, but they're all lined up just right. That approach works really well on GPFS. But if you do that on Luster, you get very bad performance. That on Luster, what you need to do is something called a group cyclic distribution, and you want to make sure that all the data ends up for one uh, IO aggregator. You want all the data to end up on one of uh, these OST, one of these file system servers for Luster. And to do that, it's, it's kind of finicky and, and piddly, and so you got to do a lot of math. And uh, it, so again, if you do, but if you do this approach, this group cyclic approach, you take that to a GPS file system, you get terrible platform terrible performance again. So uh, we have often seen computational scientists who are uh, both pragmatic and clever uh, say, okay, look, um, I'm getting bad performance having everybody do I.O. I'm going to write from a subset of processes. I'm going to do things this way and that way. And uh, what happens is that they're working at um, cross purposes with the MPI.O. library and in some ways undermining what's already happening. I like to show this graph because many times, right, I get a talk like this and people might try some of these techniques and then get bad performance. And I say this, I offer this, this story as a way of saying don't give up hope uh, and we can um, work through initial problems and have good successes here. So the way the story goes is uh, you know, people jump on a machine, they, they don't want to create a million files, so they write a single shared file. And as a result, they get very, very bad performance. You know, it's just crawling very bad. So, okay, uh, again, pragmatic and clever, the computational scientist will then do one file per process and create those million files because, you know, some grad student is going to deal with it after after that. Uh, I'm just getting the job done. You know, three orders of magnitude better performance, feeling pretty good about themselves. And, uh, you know, go to talk like this. I, I should use collective I.O. to a single shared file. That would be the right thing to do. And they do that, and okay, yeah, better than the, the, the single shared file because you know MPIO is doing some optimizations here, but performance is, is a quarter of what they were seeing before. Now, the reason why there was a quarter of what they were seeing before is that in, in this particular instance, some of the default values on our blue gene system uh, were carried over from a previous generation. And so we didn't ask uh, enough network links to participate in the collective I.O. call. When we change that default parameter to be a little bit more, to make more sense for this machine, well then now performance has jumped up quite a bit. And, and not only are you getting the good bandwidth, you're getting a little bit better bandwidth because you're not paying metadata costs having one, many, many files being created in the same directory. So uh, you know, if you are an attendee at a talk like this and you try to do some of the clever best practices that people are talking about and you get bad experiences, uh, I hope your reaction is not to uh, dismiss everything you've learned at a talk like this, but you know, you know, be a little more persistent, work with your site administrators, uh, site consultants, or folks like me, and we can figure out what's going on here. And it's probably an interesting puzzle that will help not just you, but everybody using these systems. 
So I'm going to wrap up on, on MPIO here. Any, any questions uh, locally or remotely? No? All right. I was in the Slack channel yesterday for the Kudu talk, and I could not do it because it was like a thousand things a minute happening. So uh, I guess uh, a little less exciting than, than Kudu, but that's all right. So MPIO. <coughs> Uh, there are a lot of other features we didn't talk about in MPI.io. Uh, I really wouldn't worry too much about them. You, you might go off and implement a direct uh, straight MPI.io library, and that's great if you, if you want to do that. But uh, I think more often you'll find it as a, uh, a building block for higher level libraries. And, uh, and so with that, we'll segue to... Uh, oh, right, one more thing. Uh, if you are looking to learn more about MPIO, I suggest this uh, book, Using Advanced MPI. It's a fantastic chapter or two about um, MPIO semantics and all the details and, and, and examples of how you might, uh, some more examples of how you might use it directly. Uh, I'm not sure about other systems. On the Cray, Man Intro MPI will give you lots of information about uh, the MPIO tuning parameters. So if you are getting, the, getting that performance, uh, I would not suggest walking through these 3,000 lines of, of environment variables and, and things, but it, there are lots of ways that, that we can adjust the, the library uh, and make things work better for specific workloads. All right. So I had uh, grand ideas of covering both parallel SCDF and HDF5 in a 90-minute talk, uh, and then realized that was completely untenable. So I'm going to talk exclusively about parallel NetCDF. Uh, I, I think most people would are uh, will, will either be uh, more oh, yeah, sorry. In in reality, uh, more at domains are using HDF5 than parallel NetCDF. Although parallel NetCDF has a, um, a very firm toehold in the climate and weather communities. Outside those communities, it's mostly HDF5. And in fact, uh, HDF5 is the underlying underlying library for. for Newer, newer libraries in the, in the climate and weather codes. But um, the two interfaces uh, are fairly drastically different in, in designs, and so uh, it's a little more straightforward to explain the parallel NetCDF interface in a talk like this. And then you can use, you can then go off and learn HDF. I would know. So, big picture, the data model libraries or high-level I.O. libraries are a start, they're not, it's not the whole thing yet, but it's a start at making sure, at providing a, uh, a more application targeted interface. And not only is the interface part of it, but also the file itself has a self describing, it's a self describing portable file form. Now, when you, when you work with parallel NCDF or HDF5 or one of these other libraries, you don't need to worry about uh, offsets in the file, you don't need to worry about details of how files are dealt with. All those um, low-level details are, are in the library and, and dealt with for you. What you get as a user is an array-oriented interface that lets you provide annotations on the data set and, and the variables, and uh, a portable file that you can take to different machines that is uh, what we call self-describing. You can query that file and figure out how many variables are inside of it, what kind of, what kind of variables they are, and uh, what else is going on inside that file. Uh, so while, while I will speak fairly authoritatively about parallel net CDF, uh, our friends at Northwestern have been doing the lion's share of the development over the last few years, but uh, it's been a, a pretty good collaboration between Argon and Northwestern on the parallel net CDF library. Uh, Rob? Oh, yeah, question. There's a question, so I'll read it um, from Kenneth Daniel. Is it easy to use MPI accumulate and then use MPI IO's output to accumulate a value? Uh, so the question was about using MPI accumulate and then using MPI IO to write the result. Um, yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, accumulate is going to is a yeah, it, it, uh, a memory it's a memory operation. So, however you're getting data into memory, uh, whether it's accumulate or or, or RMA get and put or uh, sends and receives, 
or you just generate the data yourself. Uh, that's sort of orthogonal to the MPIO uh, problem. Once you have that memory buffer and you know how big it is and what's in it, then you can describe the memory buffer to MPIO and, and write it out that way. Give uh, you have a specific uh, MPI accumulate example. We can talk more offline about how that might happen. Great, thanks. But thanks for asking a question. All right. Oh, back to Carlos. Yeah. Uh, we started this work at, at Argon because the uh, Unidata serial net CDF project, while 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 uh, widely used, uh, did not have a parallel interface. So we liked that they had a, a self-describing portable file format, and so we took their format and left that the same. But we uh, took it, we wrote a new API that was similar to, but uh, in spirit, but different from uh, serial NetCDF. We wouldn't have any problem. Applications wouldn't accidentally link against our library and their libraries because it's separate that way. But like classic NetCDF, if there's a there's a single NetCDF data set. And that data set hosts multidimensional arrays uh, of, of many dimensions. I don't know what the limit is, but it's pretty high. And then we can put attributes on those files, on those variables, and on the data set itself. Uh, there, are a couple, there are a lot of features that Parallel NetCDF added to the, the NetCDF yeah, space, the idea of collective I.O., uh, non-blocking I.O., which I don't think I'll be able to talk to very much. Uh, but the idea of using MPI data types to describe the memory to, to pass a memory description down to the uh, NetCDF data set um, that we added here, and then uh, and then a few years after we did our work, something called NetCDF four came about, which added parallel I/O to uh, NetCDF. So I'm terribly sorry, but there's going to be a little bit of confusion here. Uh, there's um, there are two parallel NetCDFs out there. Uh, we will often call we will often call our project PNetCDF. That's a Way of differentiating the two, or um, Northwestern Argon North, uh, Parallel NCDF, or we'll say it real fast: Parallel NCDF. And then, if you have a unidata Parallel NCDF, there might be a bit of a pause there between the Parallel and NCDF part. But uh, so it's a, that's a uh, error-prone way of just to make a distinction. Just be careful about. Okay, we have documentation online if you um, would like to learn more about uh, how to use Parallel NCDF and the different. Um, Interfaces more than what I'm going to cover here in this talk. Uh, the quick tutorial should walk you through a couple of basic idioms that you'll see a lot in parallel CDF. <coughs> the NetCDF and parallel NetCDF data model is just like I've been saying uh, over and over again. On the left, there's the idea that there are these multidimensional arrays. So it's typically done in climate code. We might have a uh, a, a the pressure, the temperature of a, a region of the atmosphere. Or we will look at the barometric pressure at, at, at some patch of land. But those variables, uh, you know, they don't have offsets in them. They don't have bytes in a file. They're, they are scientific abstractions. And so uh, that's the side that's exposed to the, the caller. And inside the NetCDS library, the header will say things like, I've got this many variables. And only, in, only inside this header, only tucked away from the user, would be notions of start finding this data at this office. Uh, another nice thing about these um, this data, this data model is that you can keep the, and you can annotate things like the units that are being used for this measurement. Uh, we like the NetCDF data model a lot because the way it's set up, the, the header at the beginning, and then uh, all the data is described, and then you can have chunks of, you can have so the nice thing about a, a, parallel, a parallel NetCDF or a NetCDF data set is that the variables are all kept in, in big, uh, contiguous chunks. The first variable shows up in the file, second variable shows up after that, third variable, fourth variable. And uh, there's no need to worry about complicated layouts. Now, that comes with some restrictions, but if those restrictions are OK with the application, then we get a pretty uh, straightforward file layout algorithm. There is one complication. Record variables are worth considering. Uh, a record variable, okay, in the non-record variable case, you know how big the dimensions are going to be. Oh, hey, Martin. 
the problem. And a record variable, so in a non-record variable, you, have, you know who decides the variable is going to be allocated, like I said. But in a record variable, picture like a temperature sensor out in a field measuring uh, temperatures every 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 hour. Uh, you're going to keep adding all these records to the variable, and and so as a result, if you have many record variables in a file, they will be interleaved, kind of like cards or or papers in a file folder, and that can have impl implications for performance. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, so again, I mentioned a little bit of restrictions on what you can and can't do in a, in a net CDF world, and there's this idea of Pre-declaring your I/O is and when you write a NetCDF data set, you have to have a, a defined mode where you say, "I'm going to use these variables and these dimensions and these attributes," and then <coughs> you exit defined mode and go into data mode. And now, uh, as a, in, a, in a general sense, this is a decoupling of uh, describing what you're going to do. And you, sorry, you're decoupling the description of what you're going to do with the execution of what you're going to do. And you'll find in, in many cases in parallel in the parallel I/O stack, if you can do that, you'll be able to get uh, a lot better performance. Again, you're, you're providing more descriptions of what's going to happen to the library. So, non-blocking I/O, non-blocking sends and receives in MPI message passing. That's kind of an example of this, where you you post your sends and you post your receive when you wait for completion. An MPI library might wait until that, that wait call to do any work at all. Uh, and then if you can provide MPI data types, again, you're describing the kind of data you're going to write. Right there. Okay, so you, I have, I assume, checked out the uh, examples repository. There should be an example there, a skeleton you can work on to uh, achieve the same goals that we did with MPIO uh, with parallel CDS. Now, because we're, because we're writing out a data set, there's going to be this fine mode versus data mode change. So uh, at some point in your call, you'll, after having defined and, and described all the dimensions and the variables, you'll have to call NCMPI and F. You're going to need to define the X and the Y or the rows and the columns dimensions with NCMPI def dim. And we're going to associate those dimensions with a variable with the NCMPI def var call. Once you've done all that, we'll use the NCMPI put var int all call to actually do the right. So a lot going on there. Uh, NCMPI is our namespace in, in, that, in that old school primitive C way where you just put some numbers in front of your, some letters in front of your, symbol, front of your uh, functions. Uh, put, so we have puts and gets and define and acquire different, you know, different families of routines in, in parallel CDF. Uh, var A is a subarray access to an array. There's a few different flavors of that. Uh, Int, or, so there are some built-in types, so ints, floats, shorts, uh, we can work on that. Or if you don't have any type there at all, you can pass in an MPI data type, but not in this, not in this example. And then, it, and again, as with MPIO, uh, an all call means. As you go do this example, you'll need these four routines, and def to switch between define mode, data mode, uh, way to define dimensions, find variables, and uh, a way to actually put all that, all that Synthetic uh, uh, data out to a file. <coughs> so, this might be a little bit. Uh, so, press change over here. We have some examples of some of the important parts here. Uh, to define a dimension, right, we have, uh, we open a file and then we get an identifier, this NC file identifier. All these operations are done on that identifier on that, in that container. I give it a human readable name called rows. It's got some uh, some y dimension, and each process is going to write that much data out. And then, uh, because we're going to associate both dimensions with a variable, keep it an array, a two dimensional array here. Uh, so def dim, uh, and then def, def var is how we associate that dim's array that we created above uh, with a, uh, a variable identifier in. And in NetCDF, everything's done with identifiers, these are integers and integer identifiers. Uh, because we're using a high-level I.O. library, we can annotate this file. So we're going to put an attribute on a file and talk about so that you know, if you look at this file later, you can see what was going on here. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the 30th iteration I wrote of the file, you know, whatever, make us a number. 
Now, the, the big difference here I want to show in this example from compared to the uh, MPI example is that when we actually do it right, every process is going to describe uh, their local slice of the globally uh, the globally shared array. So to do that, you compute your start, your count, and, uh, and, and that's it. You don't need to worry about creating uh, MPI data types. You don't need to worry about setting file views. You don't need to worry about offsets or headers or any of those other stuff. All you need to do is figure out that uh, in terms of this global array, where do I start and how, much, how many elements am I writing? And a little simple, uh, a little simple arithmetic can get you those values. So once you've done all that, right, what's going on inside Parallel NCDF? The uh, I didn't show it on the slide, but if you, if you look at the what you call NCMPI open, you pass that a communicator. That communicator is then in turn part of the MPI file open call that's happening inside the library. The Parallel NCDF library might set some hints. You might know something about the structure of the data that, that you don't know, or, or um, what's good for the way it's using the way it's using the MPI library. Might you know, it can it'll be tweaking things possibly, and uh, because every process is setting up the uh, every pro when you do it right, every process is in find mode before they go to data mode. Everybody, every process has a local copy of the header. The, there, there's, a pro, there's a step with the library where we make sure everybody has, everybody has the same uh, consistent view of the header, but there's no need to read, to read that header again later. Um, rank zero will broadcast the, uh, its, its, its copy of the header to everybody else. So make sure everybody will say, oh yeah, that's what I have to. And then one process, rank zero, will write it out. This is great because now as we read and write variables down the line, there's no need to consult you know, different processes to see how much free block, how many free blocks there are, or how much structure there is. We can just go right to the offset file. All right, so we collectively call put var all. What happened there? Well, we didn't talk too much about the details of file set view with multidimensional arrays and, and MPI type create subarray. But that's okay. Then the parallel NCF library does that for us, and that's, that saves a lot of, that saves a lot of headaches. Uh, you know, a lot of those routines in parallel NCDF are one or two function calls removed from parallel from the MPI I/O call. So there's a pretty low overhead uh, when you use parallel NCDF compared to writing MPI effort directly. Um, and I encourage you. After you run the example, go take a look at the Darshan report. Uh, think about, again, just like the other example, what might you see in this file and what do you see? Uh, I think uh, on some systems, when I do a simple example, it's uh, well, you see what I expect would be. What I would usually expect to see is, say you ran on 16 processes, I would expect to see a collective write uh, being condensed down to one process. But some systems may not have that opposition. Uh, I mentioned a few times this idea of a self-describing file format. So you can take a, a, a arbitrary NetCDF data set, and knowing nothing about it, you can query the file and figure out what's in it. Uh, the general idea is that we you get a simple Overview of what's in the file, how many variables, how many dimensions, kind of like the MPI data types, envelopes. And then once you know how many dimensions and how many variables there are, you can start figuring out how, le how big they are and how much space you need to allocate to work with them. There's another, there's also there's this idea of a convention uh, where everybody who's working in a certain slice of the climate field, everyone who's doing ice modeling, will follow this convention, and so you can just go right to the read a variable step. You may, you may, you know, if, if, if anybody gave you an ICE data set that didn't follow convention 16, that'd be an error and you could just skip some of these steps. But even so, you may want to be able to validate and verify that this is really what you can <coughs> So, uh, unlike HDF5, I am able to squeeze a, uh, a full inquiry routine all in one slide. I don't think it's too hard to read. 
uh, I will point out the three important parts here. Right? Once we've opened the file, the, the first step here, the one, is inquiring the data set, inquiring with the data set. Right? NC file, again, that's the identifier that describes what we're working on. We get back a number of dimensions, number of variables, and a number of what's called global attributes. Uh, and then whether or not there are any unlimited or record variables in the file. Now once you have that information, we can start allocating some space. And then we can go through for each of these dimensions, we can figure out how big they are. And then once you know uh, the size of the dimensions, right, every variable in the NetCDF data set is associated with these dimensions. And we can figure out the name of the variable, the type of the variable, and uh, which of those dimensions are associated with that variable. So you could go through and you could say, look, in this data set I found uh, 16 variables, one's called temperature, one's called pressure, one's called wind speed, and, and so on and so forth. So if we're going to read parallel net CDF, uh, it's, it's a little different from the writing. And I would also point out a couple different um, things here. In our, uh, in these hands-on examples, right, because of the sake of simplicity, we can just sort of know that we've got a 2D variable in here. But um, we, can still, we still need to do some inquiry routine to work with it. So uh, you can take your, your writing example, you create a data set. Now you can have every process read one row or one column of that multidimensional array. So once you, uh, once you get the dimensions, you need to figure out you know, the length of inquired NCMPI ink them. Uh, you may want to figure out how far along in this made up simulation we are so you can get an attribute. And then finally, the real meat of the, of the example is get vera it's all. That's the actual collective read of the data. Uh, again, get, get uh, sub, 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 array, yeah, sub array read of a variable and reading integers out of it. Um, yeah, so like, like that one slide, the, the one slide example, we, we, ink, it, we ink bar. Ah, so one thing to point out here, net CDF uh, and parallel net CDF variables start from zero, the identifiers start from zero. So if you have uh, one variable in your file, the identifier for that variable is zero. So we're just going to grab the first variable out of the file, just pass a zero in there. Uh, so we'll get a, a name and a type and dimensions. And then we figure out the size of the size of the dimension, the size of the associated dimensions with NCMPI ink dim, read the attribute. And then again, as with writing, we don't need to worry about too many other steps here. We just have to figure out where in the globally, notionally global array we are locally, you know, our local contribution contribution of the global array is. And uh, everybody's going to read the same part of the data. And in this case, we're going to see if the library is any clever with that. <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, I would point out also that at no point in here do we switch from the find mode to data mode. We just kept on going. Uh, if you're going to create a new variable, you have to, you have to, to switch back into the find mode. And that could be a little expensive in some cases. So, uh, you know, if you, if you work those examples, uh, I guess I should, I should mention, I should mention too, uh, when you run this example, you should look at the Darshan log and see what you get. Uh, I would expect many implementations to do with essentially a, a read from one process and send a copy to everybody else. But uh, on theta, every uh, process did its own read. So maybe there was a threshold that we didn't hit on, on theta for the simple toy example. Okay, so parallel CDF is a, is a pretty good first high-level library to talk about because its uh, its interface is pretty simple compared to say HDF5, and its container rules are pretty simple too. It's uh, you know it's, uh, just fairly contiguous chunks of data and a little bit of complexity with the record variables. And so if you're working with multidimensional arrays in your application, you'll be doing multidimensional arrays to storage, and it's pretty good fit back and forth that way. Uh, oh, for in the early days, we had some limits on what you could do with these data sets, but we uh, worked pretty hard to relax those limits 
and then worked with the uh, upstream Unidata NetCDF folks so that they could be they could, they could, they could recognize this, this new file format. And so, uh, as a result, uh, if you create a very large variable, uh, you know, a, a, we call CDF5 library in, in parallel NetCDF, the Unidata NetCDF tools can still read that. So we're, we're just mentioning that as a way of saying we we'll take this compatibility between the two ecosystems pretty seriously. There are lots of high level high level IO libraries and uh, I would like to talk about all of them but only have time to cover parallel and SCDF. But uh, HDF5 has lots of documentation on the website about about that interface. Uh, HDF5 is a lot more sophisticated than parallel and SCDF. You have this notion of hyperslabs to describe not just uh, subarray accesses, but with enough Manipulation, you can describe arbitrarily arbitrary shapes in your data sets. Uh, again, that's useful for certain domains, but it complicates the structure a little bit. Uh, there, there are notions of compression and other filters you can do to the data in HDF5, and so as a result, their file format is a little more complicated. And um, what, that, what that means is every so often we find a, a, a an access pattern in HDF5 that isn't performing very well, and then we work with them to make sure that that gets fixed and going on that way for 15, 20 years and, and we keep finding areas and it's a very good collaboration. They find problems in MPIO and they find problems in HDF5 and it works out pretty well. Uh, talk about that CF4. Uh, Adios is, is very popular at Oak Ridge and, and other domains, especially in the combustion, XGC I think is their big code, but they're using, they, they've been working with other applications too. The big the selling point for Adios, like the quick pitch there is, uh, there's a config file that describes different ways you can do the I.O. And so if you find that uh, collective I.O. is performing poorly on your uh, your one system, you just change it to XML config and then now you can do raw binary I.O. file per process, whatever approach makes sense for you. I also want to highlight H5 part. That's a case where they took the HDF5 API, which is, I think is something like 300 or 400 routines, and simplified it down to six. And uh, with those six routines, the particle simulation codes can, can go off and, and, and model trillions of particles. Uh, sometimes a closely tailored interface is, is perfectly fine. Uh, the climate codes have other uh, abstractions on, on top of abstractions. So uh, PIO, for example, is a uh, called stands for parallel IO, which is not which has the name. Collisions there, but uh, the point of that library is we're able to they're able to pick different uh, approaches. So serial NetCDF, parallel NetCDF, raw MPI, IO, binary, uh, and they're able to, to try different approaches out. And they can see like, all right, look, if I do uh, MPI, IO, I get performance X. If I use parallel NetCDF, I get performance Y. Uh, y is this worse or better? And, and so again, pragmatic computer scientists is trying to make sure that they can get uh, their job done. Uh, so. With that, I would say uh, the closing note here is that these high-level libraries, the MPIO libraries, the, the file systems, the, the tools like Darshan, there are a whole host, whole host of ecosystem uh, components out there. So that if you are trying to uh, to do something with your, your application, you're getting bad I/O performance. There is probably somebody or some tool that can help you, and uh, you, know, you don't need to struggle with silence. So uh, I'm happy to talk. Is there any questions we have, either locally or, or remotely, or, uh, or anything else? Here? No, 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 no. Thank you very much, Rob, and your team to help put this together. Are there any questions from anyone? All right. Well, uh, I'll keep an eye on the Slack channel for a while, um, and tomorrow, and we can talk about things there over in the parallel IO uh, channel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again.